Welcome to Njenjeria TV. I am Mazi Ochuku Ezoke. I welcome you this evening for a very interesting conversation with my distinguished guest, Mr. Peter Obi, the former governor of Anambra State and the vice presidential candidate to, to Alahaji Atiku Abubakar in the 2019 presidential election. You're welcome to Njenje Media TV. Good evening, sir. Yes, good evening. Can you hear me very well? Yes, I can hear you. We can hear you very well. Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. We can okay. hear you. So while, while we do that, now let me quickly, by a mere form of introduction, introduce my guest this evening again. Mr. Pitobi is married with two kids. He attended the Christ the King College Secondary School on Nature, where he obtained his uh, West African School Certificate um, result, and he proceeded to the University of Nigeria, where he obtained uh, philosophy, a Bachelor's of Arts, Lagos State uh, School, sorry, Lagos Business School, Nigeria, where he did his chief executive program. He proceeded to Harvard Business School, Boston, USA, Meet to Meet Marketing. In the same Harvard Business School, Boston, he also did a program, Change the Game. He proceeded to London School of Economics, Financial Management, Business Policy, Columbia School of, uh, 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 sorry, Columbian School, uh, Business School, New York, USA, where he obtained uh, marketing management. Also, Institute for International, uh, Institute for Management Development, Switzerland, senior executive program. There are numerous, numerous programs that he has done. He is a man well vast that had held various positions. One of those positions that he held is, as many of you are aware, the governorship of Anambra State between the two between 2006 and 2014. Also, as a special advisor to President on Finance, that was uh, the uh, President Goodluck Ebele Jonathan till May 2015. Member Presidential Economic Management Team to again that's same May 2015. He was, like I said before, um, the vice. Chairman Nigerian Governors Forum, and also eventually became the chairman of the Governors Forum, uh, Southeast Governors Forum. Also, former chairman, Board of Securities and Exchange Commission, SA, uh, uh, SEC, and former chairman, Fidelity Bank, PLC. He has been in so many boards uh, across the nation. Now, I have the privilege once more to introduce to you. Uh, Mr. Peter Obi, and to have this one-on-one -on -one conversation with him here at Engine Media TV. Mr. Governor, His Excellency, Hello. I invite you once more and I say good evening to you. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you. This interview has taken quite a while. I'm happy with finally being, being fulfilled. Now, uh, for our viewers, this interview was scheduled to happen 1st October 2021, but obviously here we are. The good thing is that it's finally happening. Now, um, to start the conversation rolling, obviously it has been a while you left government. I would say since May 2015. How has life been and what is it that you've been doing since you left government actively what is it I've been doing in order to keep yourself busy? Well, I actually left, uh, not May, I left in March 17, 2014. So you're talking approximately eight years. And um, that's a very good question to ask. I've been actively involved in public life. You know, for me, the... Um, being in politics is not about uh, winning an election or being in office. You know, because people think once you're in politics, uh, 
you only uh, active when you're in office or when you've won an election. All these eight years have taken me to tour virtually every part of Nigeria. I've been to about three schools in Sokoto, in Nasarawa, in Kogi, in various parts of Nigeria. Benue, I've been touring schools as you can follow me, but um, in several schools in Anambra, Imo, Abia, all over the place visiting health institutions, trying to help with schools of nursing, midwifery, and things like that. going to visit small farms owned by uh, rural people and everything. So I've been very busy, extremely busy. Among that, I'm doing my own little uh, business to earn an income for a living. Because as you know, I don't have any pension. Um, it will be surprising for many people to hear that you do not have a pension. As a former governor, obviously we do know that former governors, the moment they leave office, they do have pension. So why is it that you said you don't have pension? Well, I don't have one. I think it can, of course, I'm lucky. I might be that most people and um, who know me very well, I know I'm very well, but not. they've never bought me even a, 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 how do I call it, a, a bottle of water or a can of water. You know, I've never received even a bottle of Coke from an Ambra state that I left eight years ago. Why so, is that so? Is that, out of, is that out of choice or that, I mean, that they are not getting what you're entitled to, sir? Well, I don't know. Well, let me tell you. I remember very well that when I was in office, that one I remember. The then speaker wanted us to pass a law about uh, governor's compensation, all these laws that, oh, you build a house for you in Abuja, build one in Oka, build one in this, and all that and all that. And they brought it to me and I said, I'm not part of it. When I leave here, I'm going, and that's it. Of course, my commissioner for land, everything wanted, oh, why did you want to say, listen, as far as I'm concerned, I do not have a piece of land in Oka allocated to me directly or indirectly. I don't have a house, and I don't have one built by an ambassador for me. And if they pass that law, the law like that, I don't know. When they brought it, I said, once I leave here, I'm gone, you know. And, uh, and that has been the case from wherever I've served. And my brother has, has, has gone in all the places I've served, be it as a board member in all the companies you've mentioned, including agencies like SEC, none of them will ever say, they gave me any form of um, uh, what, what they normally give, allowances like car, house, anything, not one of them. That but, one is out of choice, though. Okay, so, um, you know, to move on from here, I will take it that it is a choice not to take, not that you no, are the not. One, being... the, one, the last one is a choice. The other one is a. And we never had any law like that. If they had, if there was, I don't know. If one was passed when I left, I don't know. But I personally said no, that I don't want this law. If anybody is coming here to serve, it's coming to serve the people, and you serve and go. Without, okay, that's fine. Thank you very much for, um, you know, for that. Now, obviously, you said you you've been keeping busy by the way of how you've been visiting various states, you've been going to states within the, the northern region and also within the southern region. Question then is, is there, you know, when you go to these schools, is there things you think that the government, or rather, do you think there are, you know, things lacking that the government could probably change in, in by way of the way things are managed? 
No, definitely. You know, it's not since you know there's a lot to do when it comes to education. You can have uh, the highest number of our school children, over 15 million, and you're talking about is there anything to do where the schools are managed? The school's education is totally underfunded in Nigeria, and everybody knows that. You need to do a lot more, a lot more of investment in education. We see education here as an investment, but education is an investment because everybody knows that the more you invest in education, the better your economy. And that was proved even in our own small investment in Anambra State. As we were improving in education, things was getting better in the state. In 2012, I remember the then Minister Planning, Sam Sudi Nussman, coming to Anambra and saying that in the past four years, Anambra has been able to do things that brought them where they are. They have the least unemployment in the entire country from their studies. The more you invest in education, the better your economy. That is what is accepted globally. There's nothing that China or Asia and all this indeed that brought them where they are than education. And you know that whatever you are seeing in the world today that is making nations move is education. Okay, so having having looked at that, I mean, obviously, it's education is a key, as you rightly pointed out. Education is engine. Okay, education education is engine. Now, but does it appear to you that we understand that actually, as a people, as a nation, that the education is actually the engine of whatever we are doing? Come again. I said, does it does it appear to you that we actually do understand that education is the engine? No, I don't think we I don't think we understand that. If we understand it, we'll approach education differently. The way education is approached here is wrong. If we understand it, we'll be more aggressive in what we're doing. If we actually understand what we need to do for development, we will do things differently. True, I, I'm, and I think maybe because personally, um, you know, before we move further, I would take, you know, staying on the realm of education, I would say because probably that you have a different understanding. That's why you did take the approach you took while, uh, you know, while you served as the governor of Anambra State. Now, you anchored your, your, you know, your developmental plan as the governor of Anambra State then, based on the Millennium Development Goal. That is, you know, you know if, if, if we look at today, would you consider that government needs to look holistically and work towards such goal in order to get to where nations ought to be? Well, quite frankly, whenever I look at it, it's not as if I anchored my destiny. The world sat down and developed a clear roadmap of what nations need to do if they want to develop. It is a properly articulated goal that if you follow this path, you will get to where you want to go. It's like somebody has shown you a road that this is the way to go. You were part of the formulation. You were signatory. Nigeria was a signatory to MDG, Brilliant Development Goals, as other countries of the world. That means you adopted, you accepted it. Other countries took it back home, like China. China took it back home, mainstreamed it in their development, from their local government to the regional to central and aggressively 
follow the goal is implementation. And of course, you can go and follow the China success story. With the strict implementation of MDG from 2000 to 2015, China was able to pull 439 million people out of poverty. India did a similar thing, and in two years, pulled 176 million people out of poverty. Because we didn't follow it, within the same period, we threw more people into poverty. That's why today we are the world poverty capital, where we have more people living in poverty than China and India combined. A country of two point combined population of about 2.8 billion, and with 200 million, we have more people living in poverty than two of them combined. So, is it, so what we did was doing the right thing by following the MDG goals strictly. All that we added to it was to develop our own strategy for the delivery, which we christened an umbrella integrated development strategy. But it was just a strategy to deliver Millennium Development Goals, which is a very clear and well articulated plan of development. And if you look at it, you will see that it's anchored on H Human Development Index, which is one issue of fighting extreme poverty, two is education, and health. Yeah. And that is all H is all about. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, but now, if we if we move from the realm of education and now say, can we take a holistic view of Nigeria as a society? Nigeria, obviously, is sixty one since it since it is is gotten its independent from the colonial master. Now, there are other nations that have their own independence. At the same time that we had ours. Question then is in your mind, do you think that Nigeria is in any way getting it right since independence? And if we do not, or if we are not getting it right, what do you think is the core issue that that makes us not to get it right? Well, I guess you know the answer. Because uh, I don't think anybody who is reasonable knows the answer to the question. I think if we are getting it right, we cannot be the world poverty capital. If we are getting it right, we cannot have the highest number of out of school children. If we are getting it right, we cannot be the world capital of drug abuse. If we're not getting it right, we cannot have the highest infant mortality. If we're getting it right, we won't be the third most rise country. If we're getting it right, we can't be, if we can't have uh, over 50% unemployment. The list are on, you can go on and on. So I think we're getting it wrong. And basically, what you are seeing here is cumulative effect of leadership failure over the years. It is not just one, uh, just not a particular leader of this one. It's a cumulative effect that we have not done things properly the way our bear has been able to. And that is why. We have all these negative situations. 
Now, we are not, we've not been getting it right. And obviously, as you said, that's the reason why we have insecurity. We've been classified as the uh, poverty capital of the world. And there are a lot of things that are not right. Obviously, everyone, you know, we, we, we know these things. And these things are very obvious for us to see. If we come down, let's take these points one by one. If we come down to the economy, you know, obviously, there are nations called the BRICS nations. If we put ourselves side by side with the BRIC nation, do you think, you know, because I, I don't want us to do a, a you know, a, a comparative analysis with nations, people can say, oh, they've been, they've been have they have democracy since 200 years, 300 years. Yeah. But, the BRIC nation, but the BRIC nations are also those that are in, in close proximity to us. Do you think that, we in any way can compare to any of the BRIC nations where we are today? Well, let me tell, let me tell you that yeah, very good question. Uh, first is that we are among the BRIC nations that are supposed to be Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. That is that where we naturally belong to. But even to further uh, elucidate this, there, there is other, there is after the BRICS nation was a, um, they put together, there was another block mooted which they called Mint, which is Mexico, um, Indonesia, Nigeria, and Turkey. Now, to tell you that we've, uh, we've not done very well, or uh, haven't even tried to be where we should be. Let me take the two biggest economy in the BRICS nation. They are the fastest two, China and India. And then in the mint, the two biggest one is Indonesia and Nigeria. I probably add an additional thriving Asian nation today, Bangladesh, because it's highly populated, about 163 million, and come to West Africa and take our neighbor, Ghana, even when it's smaller in population, to be able to tell you we've not done well. And you are looking at 61 years. I don't want to look at 61 years. I've always said it because of the civil war. I always like to minus 10, 15, or 20 years from Nigerian history to be able to compare whether we are doing well or not. So if I do a minus 20 for 1960, we'll be at 19, 1980. So I want to compare Nigeria from 1981. And you see how bad So let's say the war did not allow us to do the right thing. And then another 10 years after that, we should be doing the right thing. In 1981, this is before the HDI was formulated by the Pakistani economists, one of the most critical measure of development, as you know, is GDP and GDP per capita. GDP, GDP per capita is actually the measure that shows a well-being because of uh, standard of livelihood of the citizens of a nation. If you go to 1981, you will see that China per capita is $197. India per capita is $270. Indonesia is $565. 
Bangladesh is 247 Bangladesh and Ghana is 270. Nigerian per capita in 1981 is 2,180. So China per capita is about 10% of Nigeria per capita in 1981. Same is China. Indonesia, about 20%. Ghana, about, call it about 14, 15%. And Bangladesh, about 10%. This is 1981. If you bring it to today, so that I can do it for you, otherwise I will show you what it was in 2001. But let me leave that for, because of timing. If you bring it to today, today, China per capita, is about $10,500. That is about 50 times what it was in 1981. 1981, it was only about 10% of ours, right? Ours. Today is 10,000. So it is clearly about five times ours. So it's good. Look, I run 50 times. India today, which is on about 10% of ours, then is same as us. We are just about 2,000. India is just about 2,000. Indonesia is 4,250. So they move from they move at this about seven and a half times. India has done about, like I said, 10 times. India have done. Then Bangladesh is about 2,000. So they've moved about, again, they've been able to do about nine to 10 times. Ghana is 2,000. 200 or something. So Ghana has been able to move about, call it about almost nine, ten times. Nigeria is 2,000. So we've actually, in a minus from 1981 to date, where per capita has not moved. So for the past 40 years, Nigerian economy actually got worse. Our growth economically got worse from where we were in 1981. That shows how bad we are. By 1990, like I said, the famous Pakistani economist developed Human Development Index as a further means of United Nations Development Program to measure development. And that is HDI is the composite index measure of life expectancy, education, and income per capita. In 1980, all these six countries I mentioned were in what they classified as low because this HGI is classified into four different sections low, medium, high, very high. I always say in some cases very low. So, 
in 1990, China, India, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Ghana, and Nigeria were classified low. Today, China is high, India is medium, Indonesia is high, Bangladesh is medium, Ghana is medium, and all the three in medium are struggling to enter the high bracket. Nigeria from 1990 to date remained in low. So this is all you have to do. I know this is a comparison of the economy. You can go on on and on. The list is endless. If no. you look at it, your foreign reserve, for example, a country like Bangladesh have less than a billion in foreign reserve in 1981. Today, as of 1981, 1980, 1981, Nigerian foreign reserve is 10 billion dollars, 10.5 10 virtually. China is 10. Indonesia is six. Indonesia is six point five billion. Today, China is three point four trillion. Bangladesh with less than a billion is at eight billion, which is what we have now at eight billion. All the countries like Indonesia move from six point five to hundred and something. I can go on and on and give you what. If uh, if uh, if I may come in here, let's just yeah come in. If I may come in here, you know you've read out the figures of nations that were in the same at some point. Nigeria actually were better. Now Far suddenly, better. you know, and now they've all all gone. I mean, it's it they've left us behind. That even if we, if we walk yes, there at yes. night, it might actually take us decades to even get to where they are today. Now, question is, what is it, in your opinion, that kept us where, I mean, everybody says, you know, you hear people argue and say bad leadership, poor governance, but is it really bad leadership? Because when we want to, uh, or some even say the incursion of military in, in, in civilian government, I mean, uh, uh, Pakistan or, or um, some of them, uh, uh, you know, in Asia had the same issue that we had. You know, it's, yes. so, it's not, so it's not necessarily that, oh, we are the only people that had that. And even as you just right, as you mentioned before, Ghana, next door neighbor, even as small as they are, appear to be doing well. Some have argued that our problem is and um, could be linked to the, the, you know, how big Nigeria is, you know, making the argument that Ghana, because it's smaller, is being managed better. What do you think? Where do you think we can place our hand and say, this is exactly what is giving us problem, that in the last 40 years, we haven't made tremendous progress leading the African nation the way we ought to? Well, let me tell you, um, having a huge population can be a liability and it can be assets. China has turned it into an asset. India is now turning it into an asset. Indonesia has turned it into an asset. I can go on and on and show you nations that have turned it into an asset. I was in Bangladesh. That's why I always use them, for example. Whenever I talk and use the Asian countries, for example, people think, oh, it's just a... Because I've been there. I've been there. I've toured from Philippines to China, to Malaysia, to, I don't use Singapore because it's very tiny. I've been to Singapore several times, been to schools, my wife has been to schools there, but that is not the issue, there's more tiny country. But I've been to several Asian countries, 
sat down and studied what they are doing. I was in Bangladesh for one week, went to the rural villages, saw what the rural women were doing, how they were supporting their SME. So it is leadership. Like General Achebe said, the problem with Nigeria is leadership. And like I said, it is that it's community first of leadership failure over the years. Obviously, you've said it. Everybody had it. I, I am glad you've been able, you know, we've been able to come to this uh, um, agreement that what and the reason why we are not where we're supposed to be in the Committee of Nations is purely, and as uh, late legend uh, Professor Chinua Achebe will say, it's squarely a case of leadership, or rather, as he puts it, the failure of leadership. Now, I can give you examples. Go ahead, sir. It's a very simple thing. It's not because I'm. I don't want to. It's not because I'm involved. Take the issue of Anambra State. Anambra State schools were closed. Two thousand and one and two thousand and two. People did not go to school in Anambra State. We were people were sending their children out of secondary schools in Anambra State. And we were number 26, 27 in Neko and Waek as at the time I started. We didn't sack the teachers. We didn't import new people. But by doing the right things and following it through, we, by 2011, 12, 13, we were number one. There was nothing we changed. Alhambra State was in was one of those states I recall the then intercontinental managing director who were managing intercontinental when the central bank took it over, telling me that as a as a as an executive director in Union Bank, he will not give Anambra State money. That I didn't know there would be a time. He will see Anambra State not borrowing money, but saving money in banks. We moved it from a state where it became the first state to have a subnational service, not just in local currency, but in foreign currency. So it can be done if the, if the leadership is here. This can change. So now come back to that. You said with the right leadership that things can change. Inadvertently, without mincing what it means, we've not been having the right leadership. When you came in as the Anambra State Governor in 2006, and according to you now, by 2000, Anambra State was in the position of, in the Wayek and Neko, around 27th, the whole Federation, 36th state. That means Anambra State, at that point, were only better than ninth state. But with the targeted interventions you had in Anambra State, within a space of five years, Anambra State moved from 27 to the top, at least to the top one, two, three. Now, do you think that exactly such intervention you had in Anambra State could be replicated across Nigeria? Completely. Let me tell you, I just read the other day, which is which is what you have emulation, where they're talking about what your, your governor, Mark Inde, has been able to do in his three years of being in office. And he showed clearly, said one of the things, the achievements was moving on your state for number 25 in work and Neko to number 11. I saw it published. And that is correct because I, I used to remember that we and Oya was competing between 25 and 26. When I was there, and we said, no, we don't belong here. We must go back to be among the best six. And of course, we became number one. And that's been the position. 
I'm not saying there have been throughout the uh, issue of every leader in Nigeria is bad. But you know, when you talk about good leadership, it's something that will go over a period of time. If you are going on a journey where you are moving from, say, let me use the example of going from on where I live to Enugu, and you have a good driver that driven the vehicle from Onicha to Oka. I have a bad one that comes and reverses and take it back to Onicha. That's what in the Nigerian situation. So one man moves it to Oka, the other one reverses back to Onicha. So the whole thing is, uh, is a mess. That's what happens in Nigeria. I think, I think that that analogy is well understood. <laughs> now, if, if I come back to the issue of leadership failure again, you talked about that, you know, uh, given analogy and citing Professor Chino um, you know, the, 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 the whole thing falls on leadership. But there are other school of thought that will say, well, not entirely, that the structure of Nigeria, the way Nigeria is structured, and some will say the imbalance in the structure inhibits states, inhibits regions from attaining their uh, potentials. Do you agree with that school of thought? I agree with it. You know, I've said it before that we need to fix the engine. I agree entirely with that. These are what the good leadership will do as well. A good leader will see, if you have a good driver driving a vehicle, he will notice the faults and he will try to repair it. But if you have a bad driver, he'll just be moving on, you know, whether it is good or bad, he will just go on. But if you if you have a good driver, he will know that this vehicle is no longer moving the way it will move. He needs to maybe there's a 40 this, there's a 40 that, let's fix it and everything. Or the engine is not sounding well. These are the things a good driver, these are things a good leader will observe and say, no, we can't go on like this. We are talking about being, for example, on what you said about structure. Today, whenever people talk about a structure, you will see people in some areas thinking they might be any, the greatest beneficiary of a restructured Nigeria today are those who are actually not firmly supporting it. Okay. Because every region will just grow in, I can say, in a manner that Nigeria will become an exemplary state in a few years. Okay. I. When, if I stay on the structure of Nigeria, on this platform, I've had the privilege to interview and speak with uh, Pa Tanku Yakasai. And one of the things he said is that those that speak about restructuring haven't necessarily come out to say this is what they mean by restructure. Now, if I put that, reverse that question and put to you, in that what Pa Elder Tanku Yakasai said, what is it in your view you consider the appropriate structure for Nigeria to leapfrog, not only to develop, because we are sitting, we've sat down for a very long time. We need to aggressively, you know, leapfrog in order to catch up um, others if we have to survive as a people. Well, I agree with him to an extent that we are, those who are saying it should come out and say what they mean. Yes. This is the thing that if you have a good leader, he will call all the different components of Nigeria together. There's enough conferences today, enough papers that have been developed, articulated, which we need to dust up, call the different components and sit down and say, 
This is the way because it has to be something that has to be agreed, something that has to be discussed. It wouldn't be done in a in a manner where it is let's divide this place. No, it must be in in an organized manner where you those who have fears. You are led their fears and they see the benefit of it. But it's been done before. We have the 2014 uh, conference. As I'm saying, but no leader has been able to have the courage to bring people together and talk about the implementation. So hypothetically speaking, say we wake up tomorrow. I mean, let, let's if say... If you do this, hmm. you can use it to put a lot of issues of insecurity, issues of death. You know, there's so many things you can solve. So... If you just mentioned insecurity, does that mean you support state police? Yes. There's nothing wrong with state police. You, if you've seen the policeman power nationally cannot do the job. Well, I, I would say I had a state police when I was there. All you need is to turn the vigilantes you have in many villages into train the force and use them. As governor, I made sure every state, every community in Anambra State had their own security outfit, paid by government, bought them vehicles, equipped them in any way I can. That's the only way to have security. Okay. There's nothing wrong with state police. You need it. It's done everywhere. In fact, Nigeria is the only state I know with large population as ours without state, local government, and community policing. When I was in the University of Nigeria, Soka, we had campus security that was so efficient, very efficient, working with the police. It's not, there's nothing wrong in that. Security is very important. It's the number one thing a society provides its citizen. Lack of it means you don't have a state, you don't have a country. So do we want to continue the way we are today? How can you attract both local and foreign investors to invest in an unsecured environment? It is impossible. So whatever we can do to get that should be encouraged. Okay. Allow me maybe to play with my imagination. You know, it sometimes it goes wild. Let's, let me assume in my little cocoon that I woke up one day and hypothetically speaking that you are the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Would you implement the 2014 report? Or what would you do? I thought you what we need to do. Bring the different components together. Bring all the reports together. We'll review it. Do we need to restructure Nigeria? The answer is capital, yes. But you must do so in such a manner that everybody, everybody's fear and worries are dealt with, and they can see the benefits in this new structure of this company or enterprise called Nigeria. Okay, so um, again, I think uh, that message is very clear. Um, you are clearly and very in support of uh, restructuring. Now, Permit me to go to um, something I believe many viewers are keen and waiting to hear, which is, we've been talking about economy, the need for education to educate the public, and but in doing all these things, we've seen that Nigeria as a state has been borrowing money to fund infrastructure. If I go back to the Office of um, uh, Debt Management, the DMO, and it says that as at March 31st, 2020, that the total borrowing by Nigeria from China 
was 3.1 billion US dollars. Now, in all these monies we borrow, people tend to say, we do not see where this money go to. We hear a bachelor loot returned. People ask, what is this money being used for? Last week, we had, no, I think earlier this week, we had um, the minister, uh, uh, Babatunde Fashola, saying that, uh, Nigeria has invested, or rather that what we invest in, in infrastructure is greater than what has been done in America. In all this borrowing, my question to you, sir, is do you think that there is visible transformations commensurate to what we have been borrowing? Well, you know, I've been I've, I've I've been speaking about borrowing for several years now. If you have followed me, as I'm speaking about uh, borrowing, as far back as five years ago, when we were in recession, and the then Minister of Finance said he would spend his way out of recession, I said. The last thing you do when you are in difficulty is to borrow to continue fund your lifestyle. What you need to do is to cut your lifestyle. You know, cut your costs, cut your other things you can throw away. So for me, there's nothing wrong in borrowing. As long as it's being borrowed for investment, you're in the right direction. If you borrow for consumption, everything about borrowing is wrong. In Nigerian case, I would say most of our borrowing is for consumption. Yes, the government of, not just this government, every government in Nigeria have said they're borrowing for infrastructure. Every government in Nigeria has said they're borrowing and they're investing properly. It is not just this government. Governments in the past, even in the military era, even Shakarizera, era, the borrow said they are borrowing for investment. But it's a simple thing. If you borrow money, it's simple. You, it says, okay, it's running a company. Your company is valued approximately let's say $100,000. And you go out and borrow additional $30,000. Your company will be worth at least $130,000. If you manage the money well, Maybe it will be valued at 150. That shows you have invested the money. But if you go and borrow $30,000 and your company is now valued at 90, that means the money you borrowed is missing. It wasn't invested, it must have gone somewhere. And that has been the case of Nigeria. And I'll give you an example. Just because of want of time, I'll just use one country, Bangladesh, to give you an example. In 2010, Bangladesh GDP is $115 billion. Their per capita is $780. In 2010, 
their debt then is four to one billion dollars, about 36% of their GDP. In 2020, Bangladesh GDP is $325 billion. Their per capita is now 2,000 plus, which is about three times what it was in 2010. And their borrowing have moved to $115 billion, which again is between 35 and 6 percent of their GDP. So you could see that their GDP had grown, their per capita have tripled, which means there's a better life. Their debt has also grown. Small businesses are thriving. Today, Bangladesh exports nearly 40 billion, but above 35 clearly, of textiles to the world. You live in the UK and you see, go to shops now, you see Bangladesh this, Bangladesh that, textiles. Today, Bangladesh, that's what remittance is, is about $25 billion. They've educated their people. In fact, during the lockdown, Bangladesh had one of the highest, call it export of human capital to the world, because we're educated. Like I said, I've been to the villages. I saw people being educated, trained, usage of computer in remote areas. So you could see how borrowing and investment can be. In Nigeria, in 2010, our GDP is $360 billion dollars, about $361 billion in Nigeria in 2010. A per capita is $2,250 in 2010. At that then is about 12 to 10% of our GDP, about $40 billion. In 2020, our debt have tripled. So we are now in a debt of over $100 billion from about 40. Our GDP is about 400 billion. So all he added is all this while is just 10%. Our per capita, because of the increase in population, is now under, is now about 2,000. So our per capita we've actually, we've actually lost about 10% in our per capita. Our unemployment, while in, in Bangladesh situation, the unemployment remained under 5%. Ours have doubled since then, within this period. These monies were investing, we're supposed to pull our people out of poverty, but more and more we're pulled into poverty. It was supposed to create jobs for our people, but unemployment doubled within this period. And you can go on and on. My guess and answer is, that this borrowed money was not properly invested. We didn't produce any service. We didn't produce anything. Are they servicing 
to show you what I was saying, because it was not properly invested, even our revenue to debt servicing ratio became higher. Because if you borrow, like I said, the thirty thousand dollars I said you borrow, and you throw it away, you're going to have to work harder to be able to get money to service huge debt. True. Today, but... every one dollar, one naira we earn, we're looking for about eighty, if not more, kobo to service debt. So it's a crisis. That means sure. that the borrow, money we borrowed was not properly invested. Now, when I when I look at the data from the uh, debt management office, most of these debts, especially most of them from China, are at two point five interest rate over twenty five years, twenty seven years time, and I think any of us as business people that gets you know a loan of two point five interest to be paid to pay on over 25 years, I think that's a no-brainer. You know, obviously you can do, you know, become a millionaire, or, you know, utilizing that. But somehow it appears government that gets such loan are not able to utilize it properly. Now the question is, is it that government is investing this money into projects that are not yielding for repayment of this loan? And, the, you know, as a follow-up to that, as a governor of Anambra State, you talked about loan. I would then ask you, did you borrow when you were governor? I mean, because obviously we have to learn from example here. As a governor, did you borrow? And if you did... That one is a simple answer. You can go ask any bank or any institution whether I came to them and asked for borrowing. So how for did me, you manage if you didn't borrow them? We didn't borrow. We shut down our cost. The cost of governance before you borrow money is like a business. It's like a personal life. Before you think about borrowing, the first thing you need to do is to cut the excesses you don't need. There were a lot of things we didn't, we, we didn't need that was there. So we cut it off. That's what you need to chop off first. When you chop it off, then you can then talk about Borrowing, as I said, the cost of governance in Nigeria is unacceptable. It's totally expensive. And we need to do something about it. If you do that, you find out that you don't need to borrow. Even if you're going to borrow, you're going to borrow to support a proper and good investment in the right direction. So you think that investment might not be investment, like I said, that will return um, immediately, but you see the impact in the society. We didn't borrow, that that we saved. Areas where we wanted to borrow, we planned it. I'm going to give you an example. If you look at the erosion management today, there's an erosion management plan with one bank. That was, I can say, something I was on top of developing. When we when we found out that government government cannot fund control of erosion and other environmental issues. We approached Yaradwa then and said, let's work out a plan between federal government, state government, and World Bank to get a what we call a long-term non-interest loan for about 40 years. When we started our turnaround in education, again we approached World Bank. We said we want a 40-year non-interest loan to fund science education. Because it's one thing to fund education, it's one thing to fund science education, which is the future. 
So we said we need eighty billion a million dollars for our environmental issues, which is control of erosion, and forty million dollars to fund science education. And this loan was to be repayable in forty years without interest. And for us, in order to be able to deal with this with ease. We also initiated that we are going to save in Anambra State for the same 40 year period money in dollars. As dollar saving was supposed to achieve two things for us, or three as the case may be. Number one is that having studied what China, other Asian countries like Vietnam and this did with their small, uh, micro, small, medium enterprises, where the country was able to fund them and create, to create jobs and be able to create a, a booming economy, we decided that if we continue to save money, the way we started, now, by the year 2030, as a, as a state, we'll be able to achieve a savings of about 500 to $1 billion. Wow. But that would have that enabled continue? us to use about half a billion dollars to fund, to fund several thousand small businesses that would have made Canberra State an exemplary state in Africa. And because we're going to continue with the savings, we were still going to use the same money at the end of the 40 year tenure of this alone to repay it as we continue funding our small businesses. That's our goal. And of course, as you know, by the time I left, we've been able to achieve $156 million because our service was, target was about $15 million per annum. That was our target, and we have planned that it must continue. So, by the, time, so by the time you left the state, um, you know, this by the time you left, Anambra State had dollar savings of $156 million. $156 million. We had $50 million in Diamond Bank, $50 million in Assex Bank, $56 million in Fidelity Bank, and they were all at a yield of about seven percent on the average and those are comp the, the uh, where the calculations compound interest uh, well yes because what we said is that whatever the yield comes in we've reinvested we're not meant to touch them because we're targeting the 2030 anyway that's that's a conversation for another day obviously um the moment you left no other money has has been put into that one fifty six million dollars. Well, nobody know you can't you can say that because nobody's sure. Is when the 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 outgoing governor hands over, we will you know being a, a vast banker, I'm sure he's doing something to that. Okay, so I would uh, I take it upon myself to dig that out and see where we are with that one. Now, um, obviously, we will be uh, planning to round up soon. Um, you talked about, in, you know, when we talked about the uh, uh, state police, you mentioned insecurity. Now, and I believe there is a link to insecurity, which is poverty. You've mentioned that Nigeria is the poverty capital of the world. If people are hungry, what do you expect them to do? Now, isn't it obvious that, yes, the people are poor? That's why there is much crime happening in the society. Isn't that a given? 
that where you have such level of poverty, you know, degrading poverty, that you also must have probably that level of uh, insecurity which we have today in Nigeria. I agree with you. There's a complete correlation between poverty and insecurity. It's clear. It's a, it is a given and it's defined and accepted everywhere globally. What Asian countries, South American countries have chosen to fight insecurity is job creation. And when we talk about job creation, it is simple. You just need to support the engine of creating wealth and employment. And that is micro, small, medium enterprises. That's what they have been used everywhere. And there's a lot you can do in this direction. Is that when we're talking about restructure, for example, today, what we get from oil exports annually, or the, the whatever we export annually, you know, or from oil and other items, is on that probably $50 billion. Oil is about, accounts for about $18 billion, which at times is less. Niger states, just one state of Nigeria, is occupying a large space of, of, of about 76,000 square kilometers. That is more than two ways, Netherlands. Netherlands, including water, is about, is about 40,000 square kilometers. If you reduce the water, if you remove the water areas, it should be about 30 something. Netherlands did export of food items. In 2019, of about 120 million billion dollars. That is six times what we earn from oil. And we have a land space that is towards the land. And you have all sorts of criminality going on in Niger State today. What? Those involved are earning from criminality is not anything near what they will earn if properly engaged, if properly supported, if educated. These are the things they're saying. We can invest more. Some of these criminals today are people, if properly educated, can help us to go outside and a living and repatriate the remittances we are looking for. Today, if you go around in the Western world, you see a lot of drivers from uh, cab drivers. You see a lot of people who are doing lots of works from Bangladesh, from Egypt, from Philippines, from everywhere in the world because of the educated children every day. UK have just declared that they are lacking drivers in thousands. So they're looking for people who are educated, who can drive trucks, who can drive cars, who can do everything. If you go to but UAE, Go to Saudi and everything, you see the taxi drivers, everything, they're foreigners. Today, the number one country in, that's what remittance in, 
in Africa is Egypt. While Nigeria is receiving about 20 billion to 20 billion from diaspora remittances, Egypt is now doing 30. Egypt is now, and Egypt is about 100 million. We are about 200 million. Egypt is now doing a lot in the medical field. They even do medical equipment and sports. This is what they've done by doing the right thing. So if we do the right thing, that's what I said, population can be an asset. Today, no. the world says in, 20, in 2030, the world will be lacking people in science and technology. They will be lacking nurses and midwives. So imagine what it is if we create in every local government today school of nursing and school of midwife and decided that we are going to get ready for the world to export these people. But don't we risk so these are the revenues we're looking for? Yes, of course, those are revenues, but don't we risk uh, as well of um, the risk of brain drain obviously you train there's, not, there's, there's nothing like brain drain Indians are all over the place working in all over the world running corporations big corporations all over the world today all these big tech companies all over the world are run by Indians by Chinese people they own all the medical all the big companies Glasgow's big picture and everything if you train all your people, and there will be enough to be inside and enough to go outside and serve the world and earn an income. So you now to wrap to wrap this segment up, um, you know, or generally generally on insecurity, we all know that the nation is not um, secured. Uh, many people can no longer travel from uh, Abuja to Kaduna, a route that easily done before. Um, in the southeast, you and I. In the South is understand what is happening in the South is or what has been happening in the South East in the last couple of months. In the Southwest, it's not a bed of roses. Neither is it in the uh, uh, North East and North Central. Now, the question is, in all this insecurity, you know, that has bewildered the nation, what do you think, obviously, aside the state police, Aside, you know, investing money in education, these are points you've raised before. These are things that are linked to insecurity. Aside these two points, what is it that you think that the government, especially the current government, should take as a priority in order to ensure that there is security of life and properties within the uh, nation state? I thought it's genuine investment in job creation engine, micro small, medium enterprises. It is not about talking. It's about gen doing it genuinely. If you open TVs in Nigeria every day, you hear about support of small businesses. I happen to live in Onicha. Close to Newe, close to Aba. I have not seen small businesses being genuinely supported by the system. I've even interviewed the small businesses in Newe, in Onitsha, in every center. Are you getting this benefit? They'll tell me that whenever they see this scheme and this, they apply, but they never receive it. I read in a business day the other day, the chairman of Uyo Chamber of Commerce saying that the small businesses in Uyo have not benefited from all the various small scale, small uh, scale businesses, schemes that are they're seen every day being advertised. So does, does it then mean that these grants that are being given yeah. to uh, somewhat discriminatory in nature, that some uh, get it while some do not? Well, maybe it's not properly 
I won't say the situation, but maybe it's not properly done. Or maybe like most things in Nigeria, it ends up being a political settlement. It is a simple thing. What is driving China today, what is driving Indonesia today, is small businesses. 90% of job creation in Indonesia is small businesses. They will have a ministry of small enterprise. And there's a policy to that. Same is China. Of course, you know the case of Bangladesh, that even somebody had to be given an award that is acclaimed globally, Nobel Award, because of what he did with microcredit in, in Bangladesh. I visited there, I was in his office, I spoke with him, what he was doing with microcredit. That's what I said, I visited the old women, the, the thing we're changing their lives and everything, in villages, using it to train their kids and all that. So this is that, what we're trying to, what I'm saying here, have been practiced somewhere and it worked. All we need to do is to genuinely, sincerely replicate it here. And I'm talking from a point where I have practiced it, I've seen it. You see, when I talk about things happening here, whether it is about implementing this, whether it's about fighting corruption, whether it's about I'm doing it because I know and I've a as long as I've practiced and I know it can be done. Okay. Now um we are running out of time for the time uh, slotted for this. Let me come to something that many viewers um you know when I pushed this uh, conversation out, the most question came within two you know within two categories. Now when we talk about leadership, you talked about that the Leadership failure is what, um, you know, inhibits Nigeria from attaining the potential that it ought to. Beyond the leadership failure, now there is an issue of trust across board. Obviously, without trust, um, many have also argued that as a result of trust, that's why people see the low turnout during elections. That's on a different plank. Now, if we come back to issue of trust, there is these Panama Papers and recently Pandora Papers. Names of politicians were mentioned in that report. What do you think in terms of trust and people reading that those they trust suddenly when this report came out, their names appeared in those reports. Are there explanations, are there trajectories there that one could, you know, obviously say that these things could be explained in one way or the other? As you know, uh, very good question. As you know, my name appeared in one of them. It's a very simple thing. When you talk about trust, it's a simple thing. Somebody asked me yesterday or a day before, why is it that Nigeria is ranked low in terms of corruption? I said, go and see how corruption is measured. That for every subject, there's a process of what you are marked for. If you leave what you are being marked for, and go and pursue anything, you can fail the subject because you're not following what is expected. Marcus, give me when you have a situation like this, I use myself as an example. Peter B's name is mentioned. What you need to do is to Invite Pitobi for explanation of why he is mentioned in so so and so, like in my own case, 
I lived in the UK from 1990 until I became the governor of Anambra State. And from about 1992, 1993, on advice of Lloyds Bank, on advice of Lloyds Bank, I say I have the documents of advice, we started an investment company in one of the largest subsidiaries on their own planning. So what we were doing was to invest in small savings of ours in that investment company, as well as some of the borrowed monies was investing it in different investment portfolios. When I became governor in 2006, when I became governor in 2006, what I did was to convert that into, of course, it became a trust company. The law is clear in Nigeria that as a public office holder, you are not allowed to operate a foreign account. That law, I must say those who formulated it, did not put into account or envisage a Nigerian living in foreign country coming to work in Nigeria. The law, if I was say, thinking about those who formulated this about Nigerians going to open a foreign account when you're here. However, the law was also clear. It didn't say, throw away everything you have overseas because you're coming back. Otherwise, we would have sold our properties. So as at that time, I clearly own fully paid three houses in the UK. And these were houses in a good area of the country. And this trust was formulated and that's it. So for clarity so sake here, it continued until it was mentioned. So for me, it's a very simple thing. You go and say, like I've mentioned before, if you go into this trust, from the day I became governor to date, there was no single investment into this trust. Nothing. So it remained what it is then. Just like there's no new property bought since then to date. So it's for you to ask questions. It's for you to know what to do. These are the way to work. You investigate what is lacking in Nigeria. Is that rather than people sit down and say, this man was governor from here to this. When we talk about corruption, when we talk about mismanagement of resources, it is strictly, and that's why we don't measure corruption very well, it's strictly what you do with entrusted public power and resources. Because that is what is critical. At the time you say I'm chairman of fidelity or anything, I was managing an entrusted public assets. As a time I was governor, I'm entrusted public assets. Your investigation should be on this. How was it managed? My partner, let me tell you, no thief, no thief, I repeat, three times, no thief or somebody who 
is not a person of integrity who will see what he can steal and leave it. That's why when you go to church, they will tell you, mind your phone. Because the thief that came to church actually came to worship. But if he sees the opportunity to steal, he will still do it. I left $156 million and over 40 billion naira and invested over 20 in investment. I had the opportunity to convert that money into anything and it won't be there. It's as simple as ABC. As you say, in the whole of Africa, not even in Nigeria, no state has done that quantum of savings. If you go, and I can go on and on. So if you just get what I did for eight years, or find anybody who says he was sitting down with Peter to say, do this or do this, they say. But the company I ran while I was living in the UK is there. And I can show you an evidence that this company receives overdraft of over $7 million from Lloyds Bank. If you live in the UK, I'm sorry to use this, if you're a black man, you're a suspect. If you're a Nigerian, you're a double suspect. So for me to live in the UK, where Lloyds Bank gives me $7 million, on a normal day, I should be I should be actually, my name should be submitted for sainthood because of living in the UK as black is not an easy thing. I live there. I know okay. it's getting better now. Okay, I think I think uh, I think the, the the clear answer to the question um, is is when investigate we... when you hear this happen, investigate the person based on where he has he was entrusted public power and public resources but have you been contacted by any of the nigerian authorities of course i've, I've been several of them have contacted me but also feel persecuted and trying to ruin my bad business because rather than ask me how i governed the state how i was chairman in bank when I was a product of people are interested of, oh, how did you live in the UK? How did the Lloyds Bank work with you? How did you buy a house in 1997? For God's sake, in 1997, I was not, I didn't have any public office. You know, I was actually going to be asked now, how did you marry your wife? No, let us limit ourselves to where people should be interested in serving his people. I was entrusted the resources of Anambra State from March 2006 to March 2014. Go and investigate it. I left it. When I left, I had the best rate network. I want to get price for health. I had the best price in education. I was I won the MDG, the best performing state in MDG, was invited to speak at United Nations of my experience, I can go on and on and on and say what we did. And then we left money. We were you know, in the right that, direction. That is, you know, sitting down here, listening to you rail out these achievements under um, your leadership as a, the Anambra State Governor then, and knowing that these, fact, these are verifiable facts, then I keep... You know, it keeps bugging me why these talent cannot be used at a higher pedestal. That will now bring me to the closing question of this conversation today, which is, my viewers here would not forgive me if I close this without asking this question. You have done well for the state of Anambra State. You have done well in the private sector. Globally, you have distinguished yourself as an astounding individual. Then the question is that Nigerians now think that duty calls for you 
to come and become the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Many are asking, Mr. Pitobi, are you going to run for president come 2023? You know, this question I'm being asked and being asked every day. And I keep telling people, I am a party man, I'm a party faithful. All the elections that have followed in the past, the party that I belong to, the PDP, made a pronunciation and took a stand. At least in 2019, when I was involved, where I was gracious, I would say, I think who graciously chose me as his running mate which are men, you know, eternally grateful to him for. The party decided that the candidate will come from the North. And that was what the party decided. And I believe that the party, what is their duty to say their, what their stand is? If their stand today is South, but rest assured, come as far. If they say not, I can't do otherwise. Or they choose option that everybody is free. Then, of course, you'll be hearing from me. I, I think assure that's... you, I'm committed to building a better Nigeria. And I will, in 2023, we must ensure that a better candidate who have one is competent, have the capacity, and above all, because when we were starting, you were reading all my um, resumes and everything. Let me tell you, I know there's people here who have even better qualifications. For me, all those things, they are good. But what we are looking to Nigeria now, they are not the most critical thing. What we are looking in this country today is, one, we are looking for people of integrity, people of conscience, people who are less greedy. Educational qualification is not a measure of integrity. It doesn't guarantee that somebody is less greedy it doesn't guarantee that people have conscience. I've seen people here acquire what they don't need. I saw it while I was serving. To find corruption here, you need somebody who has an integrity, who is not greedy, who have conscience. If you have that, fighting corruption is easy because if you who is in charge is not stealing, you reduce it by 50, 70%. And it's critical that we have somebody who did that. It's not when people are acquiring land and house, everything they don't need. They want to live a lifestyle that is far beyond the economy of Nigeria, far beyond their earnings. That is why the place is collapsing. That's why we have insecurity. That's why we have poverty. We need people Thank you. who can manage the cost efficiently. And these are the critical areas. As you, will, as you look for people who will govern the country in the future. Thank you very much. That's a very fine place to anchor it. We will take one or two questions from the public. Um, we have an avalanche of questions that, that come in. Now, but before I do, as a recap for the last uh, question that I asked you regarding 2023. For many of you who have listened, what he has said, I'm, I'm recapping here, is that he is waiting on the party to make the decision where they want to zone. But be rest assured that if it's zoned to the south, that he will throw his weight and he will become a candidate. If it's thrown open, also, that is a given. On that note, I will take one of the questions here, which is, the question reads, sir, you are part of 
the good luck Jonathan government as a governor then, when the second Niger Bridge became an issue and a thing of discussion. However, that bridge was not completed before uh, good luck left office. The question also goes, was it PPP as of that time? And if it was, what led to that bridge not being completed before 2014? Well, thank you very much. You know, that bridge has taken a very long time. You know, uh, the initial conception of that bridge was that the bridge was to be constructed where an Anambra state government will contribute 10%, Delta state government will contribute 10%, federal government of Nigeria who contribute, I think about 30, 40%, and the rest will be, again, borrowed, and uh, because the bridge was going to be told. That was when, still, when Abbasanjo was still there, not even Jonathan, at the onset of my government, that's when the conception of that bridge was under, Obasanjo's government. I, as governor, vehemently opposed an Anambra state contribution. If I said that we should actually be paid because a lot of traffic is going to pass through Anambra state after the construction. We should be earning some small thing from the toll they are collecting, considering the that traffic is going to be flowing through Anambra, the pollution, the everything. We are supposed to be compensated a little bit for the income. Eventually, working with some of our, you know, state and, um, national assembly members, especially Honorable Chuman Zeribe, then chairman of. Was committee on House of Representatives, that aspect was removed. And then it became federal government business. Under Jonathan, it was accelerated because we just said it, well, listen, federal government, without involving the two states, should go on with this doing it between the federal government and a consortium that will work out a PPP. And that was it. And that was done, awarded, and flagged off. And I know a lot of payments and everything was done then. That's all I can comment on it not being anyway. a, federal, a federal government team. Well, I, okay, um, you know, I, I would have, because you said that so much, you, I would have fired a follow-up question because I'm aware that, that, that the project was meant for 36 months. Obviously, um, the reason uh, we wouldn't be holding you accountable because you weren't the works minister then, but I hope I will speak to the works minister one day to understand why a project that was supposed to last for 36 months was eventually not commissioned and that was meant to have been in 2014 ending and here we are in 2022. I don't think that it was meant to complete in 2014. I, I don't really think so because you know if I recall if you recall Jada only flagged it off in either 2013 or early 2014, because when he was flagging it off, he said he had to do this because of my own effort in the second Niger bridge, everything. There were a lot of issues. You know, the, the, that bridge was awarded to a different contractor before. This was one of the things where I protested and said it must be done by a particular contractor. And we talked about Julius Berger, this, this, this. So it was real. You know, there were a lot of issues. 
that made it not to start when it was supposed to start. But you no, know, but but now, do you okay? What we read every day is that the South East should be grateful that the current government is building this bridge. Many also say that that bridge, the government counterpart funding ha was paid during Jonathan's time. I know, I know, is it for me, let me tell you quite frankly, for me it's not, uh, the, all these comments and everybody saying this person should be grateful for this government. You know, I worked as governor of Anambra State and um, I, I did a lot of projects in different villages and everything. There's two things I always tell people. There's no village that I go to and say, you'll be grateful that I did something for you. That was what I am elected to do. So why do I want your gratitude? What am I going to do? Is that when people would come to me, people said to me, oh, Peter, when I was in government, look at all these roads you did, look at all these schools, look at all this, let's go and commission them, let's go and do this. And you tell them, okay, I want to commission in Oka, in Oka, in Oka, in Oka, I have about 30 projects. How much will it cost us to commission one? They will come with a bill of five, ten million naira. I said, listen, we build a teaching hospital here. People have seen it. You say we are going to spend another ten million to commission it. No. We want to call Live TV to commission it. Live TV says it's twelve million naira. Why are we going to do that? That is enough money to build two classrooms. We've done a road to everything if it is. Why are we going to commission it? The people have reason if it is passing the road. They can see it. They can feel it. That's what we elected to do. If I go to Onicha, for example, where Oka Road, uh, New Market Road, Uguta Road, Old Market Road, Enugu Road, Creek Road, this, they say we should do well, 30 roads. They say we should do all of them. The other day, somebody saw what you did your program in Oboko. He said to me, you see, if you have done commissioning where you when you when there's government Sakamori, when you did the Obodugu, when you did the other road, when you did this, people will not know now that they are failed and the roads are bad. I said, let me tell you, the people knew I did it then. The simple as ABC. If the road has failed today, it's because it's not been maintained. There's no road, no matter what you used to do it, that lasts forever. Bridges are collapsing in America. They collapse everywhere. There's nothing that you build that is permanent. You maintain it, whether it's building, whether it's road. I live in the UK. I lived in the UK. You live there now. Roads are maintained every five years. And I see people now telling me that road I built in 2000, and six, 2007, I failed. I said, that road is over 15 years. It's not meant forever. Even human being doesn't live forever. So if you don't, if you have a human being, if you don't eat, if you don't look after yourself, you die. Simple. Same is the road. It needs to be maintained. That's why we have a robust road maintenance agency, which have bought the equipment, equipped it, made it a different company, Insisted that every year, 10% of our budget for construction of new roads must go to road maintenance because it's critical. That is a very fine place to anchor with. And I think on that note, I will say thank you once more for being my guest. It's almost two hours. It's now one hour, 40, 49 minutes of one-on-one um, -on -one conversation. It's my pleasure to have you. I do not know if you have, uh, uh, for our teaming viewers who are watching us from across the globe, if you have your parting word, your last word for everyone. Well, my parting word for every Nigerian is that the building of this country, this country belongs to all of us. It is important that all of us work hard, contribute in any way we can, to make it a better place. And I thank you for being a good ambassador wherever you are. 
of Nigeria. God bless you and your family. Thank you very much once more. It has been my pleasure to speak to you. It's been a part of our series, the State of the Nation series, one-on-one -on -one conversation with Mr. Pitobi. As you all know, he was the former governor of Anambra State, my own state, I must put that caveat there. And also, he was the vice presidential candidate to Alaja Tiku Abubaka in the 2019 presidential election. On that note, I will say once more, everyone, thank you for joining us. This is a series that would continue every weekend. Make time to join us here at Njenje Media TV as we will continue to bring you more interesting guests. Thank you once more for being part of this program. I am once more Mazi Ezoke. Good night from here.